Thank you, Mr. Cameraman. Okay. Good job, good. Good job. So before you speak, you want to pause before you speak, and that's the acronym we talked about before when you came up here. Obviously, if we were in a training program, I'd have you come up here and pause a little bit longer before you did speak. I know we didn't really practice that. So pause, position yourself center stage, appear confident, make eye contact, smile, and breathe. And be uncomfortable with everybody staring at you and not saying a word. <laughs> it's hard, but the more you do it, the more comfortable you'll get. Why do you think that's important to pause after you present? I mean, after, before you present. Get their attention? Sure. You get, what it says here in the 11 steps of powerful public speaking on page 45, a powerful pause adds impact to your presentation. And there are many ways to use the pause, not just to get their attention before you speak, but I, you then have your strong opening, which we'll talk about in a minute, and then you pause again. Why? A powerful pause adds impact to your presentation. Also, what a pause does, how many people might use the word ah, uh, um, mm -hmm. and <laughs> never, right? I do, but I'm a lot better than I used to be. That's the whole goal, progress, not perfection, right? So I have, how, how many people watch The Office? Steve Cook was the, yeah, right? My favorite show, my favorite show. And I, this book, 100 Public Speaking Tips, is uh, a compilation of all my blog postings over the past couple of years. And I just love this one. And what he says is, so this is a good opportunity to use a pause when you have an ah uh or an um, because Michael Scott, played by Steve Carell in my favorite show, The Office, said something very funny in an episode. He was in a dip deposition meeting and had prepared to rehearse everything he was going to say. At the end, he said that he added some ahs and ers and ums on purpose, just so he would not appear as if he was prepared. <laughs> Need I say more? <laughs> so let's go back to a strong opening. Most presentations that I see of people who have not had public speaking skills training, usually, and even people who do, who have had it, <coughs> usually leave off the opening and the closing, and they just present the middle. A strong opening is so important, because that's what's going to determine, determine your audience's frame of mind to be receptive to what you're going to say. So instead of saying, coming up here and saying, hey, I got a whole bunch of information, I'm just going to get into it. They're not ready yet. They're not in the right frame of mind, frame of mind to hear you. So what, what could you do? And maybe, sh maybe someone does something now when you open your presentation that's going to grab them. Is it, uh, did everyone get a handout? Mm -hmm. Is it, let me tell you where the bathrooms are before we get started. Is it, give me a moment while I put, shut up, set up my PowerPoint slides. Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> okay. Thank you for admitting that. Now, it's okay to say those things after your opening, but if you notice today, I went right into my opening. Granted, we had some disruptions with some latecomers, but we handled them very quickly, and I, just, I went right into it. And it doesn't matter if you remember what it was or not. I went right into it. I talked about the kitchens out there and just got you engaged right away, and it had to do with the presentation. So ask a question, tell a mini a little story, say say something funny, don't tell a joke because it could backfire. No, somebody might not laugh, but you can tell a funny story. Okay, I'm gonna move on. Then we have so you have you've paused before you opened, you then had a strong opening, you paused afterwards so that it could sink in. And now we're gonna go into the body of our presentation. And the most important thing to remember is to present with a kiss with three S's. Keep it short, simple, and succinct. Does anybody here present to Generation Y? They say keep it super short. So present with a kiss. And I'm going to share with you um, uh, somebody who, a client of mine, said, said that before she came to me, she would just give her presentation, she would wing it. And she found herself going off in a tangent. And she noticed that her audiences 
were dozing off and they were daydreaming and she would go off on a tangent on certain points. Then after a session or two, she writes to me, I am now able to develop my topic without getting off on a tangent and have come up with great ways to keep my program interesting and I feel like I improve every time I give a talk. So keeping it short, simple, and sweet, sweet, and adding stories. How many people here who present include stories, examples, or analogies in their presentations? Wonderful. And if what you I would suggest to you is to do it even more, even more. And I'm gonna to give you an example of how powerful telling stories are. I had another client who said he sent me an email. Um, and he said, I had created a very important presentation in PowerPoint and was about to give it to a very demanding audience. After our session, I discovered that my approach was very in details and could have put that audience to sleep. You encouraged me to tell stories and it produced the desired outcome. I now am able to engage any audience, no matter what presentation I give. Take the stage and love it is compiled of stories. And these are, the part of it is before, is, uh, before and after stories of people who fear public speaking, they were terrible at it, and now some of them are really professional speakers. And one story in here made it to World Championship of Public Speaking Toastmasters last year. And in the, so I want to just read you some of the titles of the stories to show you how engaging stories can be. Uh, let's see, but I'm an accountant who talks to fat ladies. And this is a friend of mine who is a Weight Watchers leader. So he's telling his story. From fear to fearlessness, father knows best. And this is a woman who shares her story about her father, gives her an analogy with golf and public speaking. It's very, very inspiring. And then the rest of the book, there's six stories like that. The rest of the book are compiles of all my past monthly tips for public speaking, and a lot of them are stories. For example, one says, what I learned from Charlie Rose. So there's a little story there. Another one is Dance Up a Storm, another story to home points of public speaking rather than just saying what they are. Okay, not that. So we have the order of our presentations. We get introduced, which is not on your list. We pause before we speak. We have a strong opening. What's next? Pause. Pause again. We then go into the body of our speech with stories, examples, and analogies, and we keep it short, simple, and succinct. And then we have questions and answers. We don't have a closing, we have questions and answers. After questions and answers, we have a closing. And most people you see who present have end of questions and answers. Bad. Mark, why do you think that's bad? You, you, well, I mean, I, in my experience, you can't close on the energy that you want to close with. So, mm -hmm. you know, you sort of lose control of. Of what you want to leave people with the take home aspect of it. Absolutely. It's your final chance to remind your audience what you want them to remember most, what you want them to do. Now, it's not, this is not a good ending for me, um, of course not um. I would say if you feel an R and um coming on, just pause. Collect your thoughts, take a drink of water, look at your notes. But an ending, a not good ending would be, so remember, if you want to improve public speaking, be sure to buy my books on the way out. That's not a good ending. A good ending would be, take these tools I've shared with you today and go out and be a great presenter. If you're going to do a sales pitch or commercial, you do it somewhere earlier. Now, getting back to questions and answers. First of all, is there anybody here who likes to avoid questions and answers altogether? Good. Some, I have many clients that say, I just like to skip over that part. I'm afraid they're going to ask me a question I don't know the answer to, which who cares if you don't know the answer? We're not all perfect. You know, so I have a note here that says, open to page 49 of Take the Stage and Love It. Oh, why do you think I have flags? Okay, so it says here, I'm not going to read the whole thing because there's lots of weight. I put a lot of things here on how to, you know, use questions, how to handle questions and why it's important. But the first part is, is it necessary to include questions and answers in your presentation? And I wrote, yes, absolutely, no doubt about 